In this video, I sit down and have a chat with Rob Tunks, an entrepreneur businessman turned Aussie farmer and all around top bloke. He goes over the issues and the coming food crisis, China buying up Australian farmland to feed their population. He also goes over the issues that are happening in Victoria and the borders for Australian farmers. He goes over how to prepare and how to increase your financial position and tips for Australians to get ahead because that's something you've requested through the polls I've done on wealth creation and investing. And we go over the scenario of people fleeing the cities, not just in Australia, but around the world into the regions because they th may think there could be some unrest in the cities and how to prepare. And we go over some really big issues that's happening in Australia right now. Guys, I'm here with uh, Rob Tunks and um, he's gonna go over his story about how he went you know, pretty much from zero to $7 million uh, through creating a business. And now he's, you know, managed to retire at 30, brought a farm. He's living the Australian dream, I guess you could say. And um, a lot of us Australians love our farmers here. And I think he's got a really interesting story. and He's got some great insights that he can share with us, you know, on how to get ahead, you know, investing, building a business and, and farming and what's the farming life like in Australia. So tell us a bit about yourself, Rob. Hi, Michael. And hi to everyone who's watching. Um, when I was finishing school, I was in the stream back in the late 80s. They had streams, so the top 10% were supposed to go to uni and then the rest were supposed to go and do trade or do something with their hands or you know, office work or whatever. Um, I was in the top 10%, but I looked around at who was making the money and it turned out the, the kids with the parents that were builders or electricians or plumbers, they had much better holidays. My parents were um, lecturers. They were very well educated. Um, so my mum, my dad was a senior lecturer at Rosemary the Ag. And my mum was a bureaucrat with a, with a degree. So they were, they, were, they were both very well educated and both had good jobs, but they weren't making anything like the money that the builders and the plumbers and the electricians were making. Those are the kids that went, I went to school with that had the money to go on holidays, had the flash cars. You know, they, they were all tradespeople. They were all in their own business. So I looked at that and went, um, which I'm not going to go to university because I know how much my parents make and I can see how much money, how much these other people were making with their, with their hands. So I went and did a trade. Um, I did electronics, ended up um, basically working at Yap Labor Prison doing security. That was a fantastic job. I probably would have stayed there. I really enjoyed that. Um, got quite a good relationship with the prisoners because I worked on their, um, their, their television systems. So we were one of the few trades that we'd, we'd just go in and fix up their TVs, make sure everything was working properly, along with the security cameras and that. But yeah, it was a very, really interesting job and I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, it was with the government though, and they, they were winding back. Not that I wanted to stay there, I wanted to run my own business. Then I got the opportunity to go to Alice Springs and, and work for Telstra. And I was in Alice Springs for about two years and Telstra started withdrawing from being in the customer's environment. So they, they wanted to pull back and have the network terminate at the, at, at the customer's premises. They didn't want anything to do inside the customer's premises. So that punched a huge hole in the marketplace and I was getting phone calls um, to come and work in the customer's premises because Telstra wouldn't do it anymore. So I made a decision then that that was time to start my own business. Um, I was about 24 and started my own business and it exploded. The internet, it was this time the internet was exploding as well. So um, there was this um, opportunity to make computer networks and phone systems in Alice Springs and, and it just went insane. Um, and, the, the market exploded and, and I was working for, and I was happy to go at bush. So I was doing a lot of bush work. I was working for the uh, Granite Gold Mines, um, the Marini Gas Loop, uh, Ayers Rock, Yulara Resort. Um, yeah, it, it just went. And Centibet started as well. That was one of the, uh, the online ga gambling thing. So I was, I was involved in that. Yeah, it was just a crazy time. And, and when I got to, my, got to my 30th birthday and went, I've made enough money, I can stop answering the phone like it is having a business like that where you're on call 24 hours a day seven days a week it burns you out very fast and um yeah so i was like i'm done yeah. sold my business and uh yeah and then i had a, had a year off where i bummed around and um then decided i needed to do something else and i needed to invest the money that was going to last until i was 90 and because i grew up at rosewood the agricultural college my dad was a lecturer there and, and for the first probably eight years of my life we he had a part of the deal was they had a house, the lecturers lived on the site. So I grew up at Rosewood the Ag. So I think in my background, I was always um, leaning towards going back to agriculture, even though I didn't know anything about it. So I bought a grazing property in Southwest Victoria. My place is pretty much on the border with, um, with South Australia, um, just on the Victorian side, um, in a green park. So the 
close to the sea, so the town called Eden Hope, we're, we're a bit south of that. So it, yeah, it rains here a lot, it's cold, um, and it's basically grazing property with some cropping. We do a tiny bit of cropping, but I'm not, I'm not very good at it and yeah, stay away from it a fair bit. Yeah, it requires a fair bit of money and doesn't do as well here as, as the places that slightly dry further north. So yeah, that's my, that's my background. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think um, that's something I've uh, been really interested in is, you know, early retirement, like you managed to do, you managed to start a business, you managed to capitalize on, you know, the dot com uh, boom, which a lot of people did made some good money. But again, you have to put in the work, like you said, you did um, to get there. And then you obviously wanted to make sure that that money lasted till you're 90. And something I've been interested in is something called the fire movement that's become pretty popular the past uh, couple of years. And that's pretty much uh, where, you know, most millennials, they, um, might have a good income, but they uh, live very frugally. They reduce their expenses. They might live, you know, anywhere between 30 to 50% of their income. And then they just dollar cost average and invest in index funds and try to get a lump sum of 25 times their earnings. And then they can just withdraw 4% of that every year. And, you know, there's a 90% success rate that you'll be able to, you know, have money to your 90, but I guess you've got a way that's a lot more interesting. And, you know, I guess you can hit that milestone a lot quicker so um, do you want to tell me a bit about the business and some of the trials you had trying to start the business and, and stuff like that? Well, I actually, I was, the, thing about, the thing about being getting rich early and being able to retire is being lucky. Like you've got to, it, it's not so much skill. Like people strut around that made a lot of money and retired early and, and it really comes down to luck. I was, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It's, there's nothing, you know, you, you, if you put, a hundred different people in my situation that it would have, I, I didn't even have to advertise my business because I had the pre-existing customers from Telstra. They all knew who I was. It was a, the town was big enough to support, to, to have a lot of money for a business. Um, but people were just ringing me up. Like as soon as they heard that I'd gone out on my own, I, I just, my phone just went crazy. I never advertised and I stopped doing residential customers. Like I was at the point where I just had my select group of customers and, and I didn't service anyone else. It was like, if a residential customer rang me up, I was like, no, sorry, I just don't do that. Um, yeah, I, it just, yeah. So it was our original corporations, the people like Santa Bet and the mines. Um, and, and that was, and oh, there was a casino obviously and, and a few big hotels, but that was anyone else. That, and the, the answer was, I'm just too busy. Like I can't look after you. I've got to support my big clients. And, and it, it all comes down to luck. Like uh, at the same time, you've got to put yourself in a place that that, that luck's going to come to you. So at the moment, I'd say that, that I don't think what I did is repeatable. If you if you gave me if I if I was at twenty five again and you sent me and you get with the same skill set, I don't think I could repeat it. In fact, I'm sure I couldn't. Um, that doesn't mean I couldn't make money um, in my own business, but I don't think that explosive growth and just the crazy money that was pouring in would ever happen again. In I, it's just a roll of the dice. You know, I won the lottery. Um, the reason I bought a farming property, though, is the supply and demand curves for food is starting to cross over. So back in the 70s, we had 300 days of forward cover of, of food. So we could basically stop farming for a year and the planet would be fine. There was enough food to feed everyone for 12 months. Um, now we're at 60 days forward cover. So the, the amount of food we've got forward coverage is slipping every year. And it has been since the 70s. Like it's, people have taken their eye off that ball because no one's gone hungry. The last generation that went hungry were my grandparents and my grandma's 98. So that generation knew that they could go hungry has basically died off. Um, and, and the generation from there on, the baby boomers, they never went hungry. My, my parents have always had food on the table and, and that's been the case. And everyone's taken their eye off the food production ball. This yeah. C thing that is occurring is, is a pin that's popped the bubble earlier than it probably was going to. But there's a, our food is the critical thing at the moment. So my advice to anyone, and, and not, I can't give financial advice, this is just general okay, rubbish. <laughs> whatever, whatever I say is going to be wrong. But get closer to your food production sources you've got to get close to the people that are growing it. They, they say we can feed 11 billion people, but this, this, this thing that's happening this year, 2019, 2020, this is going to, this is, we've got some critical issues. There's been a locust plague in Africa that's, that's taken out a heap of food production. There's been floods in China that have taken out a huge amount of their food production. And this is, we're, we're right on the edge. I've, I've sent you a graph, if you can pull the food production graph that um, 
that Brian Sanders from Food Lives, I, I did an interview with him. He drew this up while I was talking to him. You can see that the, the, the whole foods, the amount of whole foods we're producing has been declining the amount per head of population. And then the processed foods has been in, making up that gap that in, in the lack of calories. So basically we need 3,000 calories per day per person on the planet. And that adds up to 24 trillion calories every day the planet has to produce. Um, but you can see there's, a, there's a, that gap between whole foods and the processed foods. And that explains too why um, people are getting into this um, fake meat it's not so much. Um, it's not so much the vegan thing. It's more that the, that's what the planets can produce for us to eat. So we can't. That everyone's getting pushed into this this rubbish food because that's what we can produce to feed everyone. So the, the whole foods component is getting smaller from your from your food from from the food supply per head of population, and it's being the rest of it's being made up with this processed crap that we're getting fed, and that's why you can almost see why we're getting fatter. And, and more unfit and everything's, everything's deteriorating just from that graph. Like that says it, that graph says everything in a snapshot. And yeah, thanks to Brian Sanders from Food Lives for drawing that. Like while I was talking to him, he did it up. I'm like, yeah, now there, there was a mathematician that worked with Einstein. They had all these really crazy long formulas. And I'm, now I know what he felt like when Einstein yeah. said, said E equals MC squared. <laughs> he just yeah. went, <laughs> 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 yeah. like that, that graph is everything. So yeah, that, that explains why I went farming too. You can see go, as you go further further back, there's more food available, and now we, everything's tightening up. Like it's really there's some yeah, there's issues in the pipeline, and food production is is key. And we've just taken our eye off the ball. They, mm. The we're not even funding like Rosary Agricultural College was funded by the guys that went hungry. So my grandparents' generation built those agricultural colleges to say we're never going hungry again. We're building these agricultural colleges to study food production. Basically, they've been winding back to nothing. Like we've just taken our off the ball. The, the, the good kids aren't are doing law and medicine. No one's taking, no one's doing food. And, and it's going to cause a huge issue down the pipeline. So as an investment advice, go, go farming. If you're, if you're young and fit, yeah, go try and, try and get out. And even if you're just working on farm, get, get close to your food production sources. The only time the population moved from, from the city to the country was in the 1920s during the Great Depression. There was a flow of people from the city to the country and we're starting to see that again. I don't think people have put a, a direct link between their food and, and, and their security, but yeah, it's, it's mm, just do it. it. <laughs> yeah. Now that's something I've definitely noticed. Um, I've noticed that the food prices are skyrocketing way higher than the consumer price index where they say you know, inflation is around 2%. I'll, I think last year a uh, carton of eggs was three bucks. Now it's $3.60. You know, milk was $3 um, for, for three liters now it's 360 um red meat has gone up so like most everyday australians can't afford to eat red meat anymore um i know me i'm eating a lot more chicken than red meat um than i used to just purely because it is becoming so unaffordable and that's something i've been thinking about lately um do i want to start living a more sustainable life of getting some land especially being locked down and here in melbourne when you get some more space wanting to um, have a bit of there, maybe not huge like yourself, but at least a, an acre or two, we can have a, you know, a veggie patch, maybe have a couple of animals, some chickens. And um, if you get locked down again, at least you've got a big, bigger piece of land to walk around, get amongst the animals, amongst nature and enjoy the sun. And uh, yeah, definitely be better than locked up in a 25 uh, square studio apartment or something like that. Absolutely. And, and, and if you're growing your own food, you have an understanding of how much effort goes into making your food. People don't appreciate how much effort goes into growing. I, I think there's only 1% of us that are involved in food production and the effort and stuff, effort and the amount of work and the amount of um, skill that's required to grow that food, people just don't appreciate it. If you're growing your own vegetables, if you've got your own chickens, you, you're going to have an understanding of what you're buying and you'll waste less even if you, even if it's not even saving it personally, you, you understand the effort that went into growing that food. Um, food red meat price is quite high. We're not getting paid that much for our lambs at the moment. There's um, if people can look it up on the MLA website, you can see how much processes get paid per beast. Um, red meat price for beef has gone up quite a lot, but lamb has fallen because the process is being shut down in Victoria. They're not running as hard as they normally do. So the bottleneck is in the in the processing side at the moment. So my lambs are worth about $6 a kilo at the moment. And, and last year they were selling for eight fifty. 
So we're, getting, we're going to get paid less unless everything opens back up. We're probably going to get paid significantly less for our land. But if you know a food producer, if you if someone in Eden, Hope, for example, could, could ring me up and say, I want land, and I'd give it to them, and they could cut it up at home if they know what they're doing. And it's not hard to learn how to, to butcher a beast. Um, and, and then you're, you're, buying, you're buying an animal for $6 a kilo. Mm. And that's carcass weight too. That's not the, that's not the physical weight there. So, yeah, the, the weight they get from the, the meat, they'll pay $6 a kilo for it if you know how to butcher it at home. And people, most people have lost that skill. It's not hard to teach someone to do it. Um, I actually don't process my own animals. I'd much rather pay the butcher. He charges $1.30 a kilo to process it because he wastes less. And I get sausages and it gets minced. So if I kill an animal, I waste quite a lot because I'm not fishing. But you, you, could, you could do it at home. If you, yeah, the more time you've got, the less, the less you'll waste. Yeah, that's something I've heard um, a few of my mates start doing is, yeah, buying um, actually a beast as a whole thing and cutting it up and something I've started to do a bit of research because, like I said, that is definitely a lot cheaper than buying it from the supermarket. So if you have a big freezer, you can just store it and um, then you don't have to worry about panic buying and, you know, punching on with people to get food at the supermarket. That's right. And if you're close to the food producers, you, you'll you just be able to ring them up and they'll have them ready to go or they'll be able to sell you one. So yeah, the, if you if you if you're young and fit and you want and you're wondering what should I do, I'd, my advice is there's plenty of work in the regions at the moment. Like farmers are screaming for people to go and help them. So mm-hmm. yeah, get off your asses and just move. Get out of the city. Um, yeah, go to the country. The houses are cheaper, way mm-hmm. cheaper, and the lifestyle is going to be better. If the, there's country living's got a few issues with it. Um, People, are all, people know everyone's business. So in a small town, everyone knows everyone's business. So you've just got to, you've got to accept that. It's not like you can't get lost in a crowd in a city. That's got good sides and bad sides because people are looking out for each other. But at the same time, people will know what you're up to. You know, if you, you go and visit a neighbour, everyone knows who you've visited. So you, there's, there's good sides and bad sides to country yeah. living. But if you, get, if you get close to your food production sources and you get to know the people that are growing it and you're... And you, Look, half handy. I'm I'm starting to push fifty now, and there's only a handful of people in my age bracket. But in the in the below thirty, there's hardly anyone who's farming. And farming takes. What I didn't know about when I bought the farm, this farm seventeen years ago, I just jumped in, bought a, a, a grazing property, thinking, oh yeah, and just run some sheep. No, how hard can it be? Yeah. It's really difficult to learn to be a farmer. It takes a long time because every 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 cycle is twelve months. So if you make a mistake, it takes you twelve months to correct a problem. Mm-hmm. If you make a mistake building a computer network, the next time you write a line of code, you, you've resolved that issue and you, you're off. To the, you, it doesn't affect you for more than two minutes. If you make a mistake in farming, it's a 12-month cycle before you can come back and correct the problem you thought it was. It might not necessarily be, what, be the problem, but it, the, the time it takes to learn to be a farmer. So all the good farmers are in their 70s, 60s and 70s, and they've been doing it their whole life. So it, it, a farming is a lifetime skill and it takes a long time to do it. And, and the returns are rubbish. Mm-hmm. Um, so just yeah so is so another question just diverting a bit do you think um people should work a job and invest their loose change uh to invest to achieve wealth creation or to achieve financial freedom or do you think people should start a business or find ways to live a more sustainable life to reduce their expenses like you know maybe getting solar panels so your electricity bills have uh, been reduced uh having water tanks so your water bills not so high growing your own, you know, fruit, veggies, uh, food, uh, what would you say? Or do you think, you know, that just investing in index funds is the best way to go? Yeah, you won't, you won't make money um, being an employee. Mm. But it's just, you've, you've got to start your own business and you've got, to, you've got to be prepared to put in the hard yards. And the thing about the business I ran um, back in 2000, the electrical business, um, computer and telecommunications business, um, I didn't actually have time to go and buy toys. So I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't lack of, I wanted to go and buy a, new, a flash car or something. I just didn't have time for it. I was working seven days a week. So that stopped me spending money. So my money was being saved, not because, not because I was, I didn't want to spend it. It's because I just didn't have time. I was flat out working and looking after other people's business, but they were paying me really well to do that. So um, I didn't, if you do have your own business, you've got to invest your money carefully as well. You've got to be doing two things. You've, you've got to be running your own business frugally and putting your money away. You see, if you've got your own business, you can hide a lot of expenses that you can't do if you're an employee. If you're an employee and you're on a top tax bracket, I don't even know what it is now, so it's 40 45% plus 40%. 2% levy, Medicare oh, levy. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've never paid that much tax ever. Like that, that that's crazy money. You mm. just don't. If you've got your own business, you're hiding things like your car. It, well, it's not even hiding it. Your you, you work car is the car you use. So mm. that's you, your laptop. Your everything. Everything you've got is part of the business that you use. Yeah. Your business is is the tax deduction. So you're not spending that. Forty five percent is crazy. You, you mm. can't get you can't get ahead if you're paying that much tax. Now it, people go, well, we can do the um, you know that where you lose money on it, on your investment on your housing investment negative gearing yeah uh, ne- negative gear. <laughs> yeah, but it, you've got it you've got to be losing money to be negative gearing anything so you you just you're either you're either paying the tax man or you you're losing money and you you you're paying interest and, and you're paying the money out to the trades people who are going to come and fix the place up mm. like it, yeah I, you can't get ahead if you're working for someone else you've got to have your own business and there's there's plenty of there's plenty of businesses that our fencing contract is pretty much done here you know, and and he's because he's got old, like, and and the young fellow that was here has moved into town, um, left and gone to Ballarat. So there's opportunities for fencing contractors, and that's not a business that requires a huge investment mm. in materials to do, yeah. and it and it doesn't require a huge skill set. You know, if someone wants to come and be a fencing contractor, come and be work for this guy for a few years, and then take mm-hmm. over his business when he retires. You, there's so much op- there is opportunity, you, and you'll make way more money, and you have a much more relaxed lifestyle if you're own your own business. The only thing. What I don't like now is there's so much red tape in business. Like I, yeah. I did start, I started another electrical business up here for six months and then went, what the, like, I, I couldn't, yeah, it was about two years ago and I couldn't believe how much more red tape there was. And I just went, I'm not playing this game. I didn't need to, I did it because I thought I was getting older. If I'm ever going to do it again, I'm, you know, and I remember the good times and then I, once I started, I realised I don't like talking to people on the phone that much. I don't like having to be nice to people on the yeah. phone. <laughs> like, what the hell am I doing? I don't need the yeah. money. Like, yeah. like, this is insane. Just stop. <laughs> just, yeah. just. But I couldn't believe how much red tape and, and barriers are in the way to running your own business now. When I, when I started at back in, before 2000, my, my um, telecommunications business, computer networking, the red tape was nothing. Like now you've got to have ladders that are the right length so you're not above that second step. So you've got to carry a heap of ladders. Like the, the occupational health and safety, the red tape around in, um, setting up a business, it, everything has just gone crazy. It's just so much more difficult. I, I really feel for people who are going in um, without, yeah, if you're starting from fresh, but it's still the only way to do it. You just... There needs to be more politics about getting rid of red tape, so it makes people, especially younger people, trying to start a business. You don't want barriers in the way. It's hard enough. It's hard enough organising money and making sure you don't go broke in the first few months. Let alone having to deal with government bureaucracies and councils and um, putting a sign up on your front fence. Like everything is just crazy. It's just everything's insane. Yeah. We just, yeah, that's we've got to we've got to cut the red tape back. Yeah, I guess that's uh, very true. And I think we're seeing red tape, you know, not just in Australia, but around the world. And I guess that's why a lot of people moved to America, um, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, had the American dream because it was so easy to start a business. And that's how a lot of people built built their wealth. Um, But yeah, in Australia, it's just becoming so hard. um, And it's just so much risk. If you get an employee and it's, you know, it's a crap employee, it's so hard to, you know, let them go. Um, But I do think that is a a big point, because especially with the taxes, because, um, as a business, yeah, you have so much expenses you can claim um, before you get paid and you go, okay, where as an employee, you can't claim anything unless, I guess that's why so many people got into property to use negative gearing, but I've never understood it because you're still losing money. You're not getting all that money you lost on tax. If your tax bracket's 30, 40%, you're only getting 40% of it back. You're still losing, you know, the other 60 to 70%. Yeah, well, farmers around here will buy, borrow money to buy more land so they can write it off so they don't have to pay much tax. But you, you're, getting, you're getting in the neck one way or the other. You're either going to have to pay interest or you've got to pay the tax man. So um, I don't like debt. I don't have any debt on this place and I'm not prepared to take any on at the moment. But um, if you go down that route of borrowing, and you, you still, you've got to get, you got to pay the tax or you get in the neck from, from the banks. Yeah, you've got, you've got to pay one way or the other. Um, yeah, I... But if you've got your own business, you can hide a lot of stuff. Not that it's not even hiding. It. It's just it's genuine just in deductions. Yeah, genuine deductions. Yeah. So, yeah, start your own business. Don't. If you're an employee, you just you're never going to get. But some things you can't. Um, you, yeah, you kind of have to. If you, yeah. Oh no, most businesses you could run. Accounts, you know, doctors. You can. Everyone can do it, I guess. Um, yeah, but yeah, go and run your own business and get out of the city. <laughs> The cities yeah. are going to be no, no good. Get close to food production sources. 
Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I've, uh, I'm building in Ballarat because, yeah, I've just seen how overpopulated, you know, Melbourne's become, how congested it's become. Um, and, yeah, it just doesn't have that community spirit really anymore. Um, people don't talk to each other and, yeah, just want to get out um, in regional. But it's still got all the uh, amenities um, that the city has, but it's also got you can get bigger blocks for cheaper. Uh, you got more community there. Um, and, yeah, it's just uh, fresher air and, I I've also one day want to probably buy a bigger block of land and yeah, like I said, start finding more self-sustaining ways to live. Yeah, yeah. So going back to that food production um, graph, so we've got this. We had a we've had a food crisis built into our we we had a food crisis built in since the nineteen seventies. So we've we've been we had that 300, 300 days of forward cover. Now we're back to sixty. But the other thing that's happening is we're mining our topsoil. So we're losing half our topsoil. Half the topsoil that we lose doesn't get replaced. So 50% of the topsoil gets every year we lose topsoil. Um, lately, we've been doing no-till cropping, which basically means we leave the trash, the, the, the unharped up. We take the harvester through and it leaves um, stalks in the ground. Now that gets left with no-till cropping. So that supports the soil so the soil doesn't blow away. But we use a lot of spray to do that. So there's an insect apocalypse coming. Our farming practices are quite harmful to the to the to the planet and harmful to the topsoil for continual. It's not it's not a sustainable system. We're using a lot of inputs to grow a lot of food to support this population that we've got. So there's there's an inbuilt food crisis was built into the way we've been operating since the 1970s, and there's no exit point. So there's always going to be a food crisis. This is why I bought a farm back when I did because I could see these graphs starting to cross over. I could see 17 years ago. I could see that the that the grass were tightening up, the amount of forward days of coverage was tightening up. Our food production was only increasing about 2% a year. Um, and we're doing it at the expense of the environment and, and the environment in terms of the soil health. So it, it, the environment in general is being affected by sprays and stuff. But but the, the key is this, the soil health is what our plants grow on and what where our food comes from. So in a grazing situation like mine, the topsoil will, this will be here in 500 years being the, run, the way I'm running it now. It'll still be, it'll still be running sheep. It'll still be fine. If you take a shovel out and stick it into my soil, you find worms and stuff. If you do that in the cropping regions, the soil looks quite dead, even though, they, even though the croppers are doing their best. Now, the difference between my place and their place is the croppers are producing 80% of the calories that we eat on the planet. So those big machines and the boom sprays and the no-till cropping, they're growing most of the food that we are eating. Um, so we can't not do it. We've, we've boxed ourselves into this situation. Um, but the food crisis that we've got in the pipeline is it, the, the, the sea thing that we're having at the moment. This, this crisis is just the pin that's popped the bubble and brought it on a lot earlier than it probably was going to happen. But the events that are occurring now where we're seeing plagues of locusts in Africa that's causing food produ production issues and the floods in China... That's just accelerated. It was always going to happen like this. There was always going to be an event that people were going to blame. Like if we had Russia produces a lot of wheat now and America does, if you've got a couple of countries and line them up and you have an event there, a weather event, that's going to cause a stress in the food production system. And we're barely keeping up now. Everything's been run absolutely maxed out. So when people are investing, what you need to keep in mind is what do you really need? You need a house over your head. You need a roof over your head so you're dry. Um, you need food. And you need some security. You know, er everything else is pretty much secondary to that. Like, if everyone wants a flash car, and cars are interesting. Like, my, my I drive a ten-year-old Land Rover. Like, that's my that's the car I drive around in, and I've got a, a great wall with you that's my work vehicle, and I've got a, a twenty-year-old Hilux that's my fire vehicle with a with a fire taker on the back. That's my cars. You know, I don't spend a lot of money on cars. Cars just suck. I, I, the Land Rover is good fun to drive. Cost me twenty grand. So. You know, even though even though I'm worth in excess of seven million dollars, the car I drive, if you, if you line the cars up down the road, I'd be driving one of the lower end cars. So <laughs> that's probably the why you've been able to keep your wealth. It's it is it's one of the key secrets. They did a study in the US a few years ago. They said, um, what do rich people drive? And what they classified as rich is someone who could go 25 years without needing any extra income coming in without selling their house. Yeah. So without leveraging up their <clears> personal <throat> house. How long could they live for? And then they asked, what did they drive? And it turned out the people that could go 25 years without needing any extra income drove 
um, five-year-old Lincolns. And a five-year-old Lincoln is basically a, a Commodore or a, or a Ford Falcon. So they drove five-year-old cars. That's what they were driving. They weren't driving anything flash. And people need to realise that. The other thing I, that I didn't know and, and, until I had a lot of money when I had you know, in excess of a million dollars in cash in the bank, I wanted the new car, I wanted a flash car, but then when I had the money in the bank, I actually didn't want it. I wasn't prepared to take out hundred grand out of go and buy it. It was like, no, I don't want it that much. <laughs> like maybe if I borrowed the money, I might have gone. But but when it when it came down to hard cold cash, I decided I didn't actually want that flash car. You know, it, yeah. You know, when I was younger, I had the magazines, you know, all of that sports car would be yeah. really nice to have a, you know, but when I, when I could physically go and take that money and buy it, I, it turns out you don't actually want it. It, mm. it. it was an interesting mental place to be. Like people, people listening to this is probably like, oh, you know, I'd like to go and buy a flash car. But when, when you've got this hard earned money that you've spent, you've slaved away at and, and you've got it in your hand and you go, I can invest this in something that's going to mm. set me up. So I'm not going to have to worry about anything or I can go and buy that flat. And it's like, it's, there's just no contest. And, and, and it was a different mindset once you can actually do it. Yeah, that's it. I guess um, probably a part of that is they want that flash car to show their friends that, that they're successful. When, when you're already successful, you don't have to, you know, try show off or try prove anything because you've already made it. And um, that's a huge thing that I think that burdens a lot of Australians because I see when property prices go up, in an area like in my area, all of a sudden I start seeing these flash cars, you know, um, start driving around because people are taking the equity out and they're putting it in, in. They've got a house. I know it's not the best asset, but it is um, an asset. They're taking that asset and they're putting, turning it into a liability by turning the house into a huge credit card. And they're just, you know, wasting all their wealth. And as soon as you drive the car off a lot, you know, it loses 10, 15% of the value. And it just, I think, loses half of its value or, you know, three quarters in the first uh, five years. So same thing. I just drive like a eight year, um, toyed uh crap tiva i call them because they're pretty crap and before that i just had um like a 2005 uh ford focus because yeah just saves so much money and that extra money you can put towards an investment um or starting a business or something like that boom yeah it's it don't don't spend your money on a new car just just don't do it unless unless you unless you've already made it yeah my partner drives a new car because what else are you going to do? Yeah, so if you if you want one and you can do it later on, go and buy a new car. But don't don't um yeah don't do it early on. It is mm. going to be burning your money away on on something that's and don't take equity out of your house. That's a crazy thing to do. If you haven't got the cash, don't buy it. That's like it. my policy for everything is pay cash, pay cash. Um, so if, if you can pay cash for a, a car, go and do it. Um, but then when you've got the cash, you'll, you'll decide that there's other things you can do with that money. Um, like I said, yeah. When, when I had the cash to go and buy a flash car, I decided I didn't want to do it. There's much better places to spend it. Yeah. So um, the return on farming is interesting. I'll let everyone know what the numbers are for my place. So awesome. I, I've got, yeah, I've got 1,500 acres and about a thousand that's grazing. The rest of it's scrub that's locked away that we can't clear because the government stole it. Um, so when government signed up to the Kyoto Agreement, they basically said we're not going to clear any more. Australia's not going to clear any more trees, and and in return, the international community gave to get the, set of the Australian government some exemptions on the Kyoto climate change. So what they did was they introduced laws that we can't clear native vegetation. So um, I've got about 500 acres of scrub here and, and I've got about 1,000 grazing acres. On those 1,000 grazing acres, I run 1,000 sheep. Um, I, this place could be pushed a fair bit harder than that. Most of my neighbours run 1.5 breeding ewes to the acre and I run one. And the reason I do that is I don't have debt. And it can be much more relaxed. If the season turns bad, I can always carry my stock through. I'm, I don't have any pressure on the livestock. I don't have any pressure to have to offload them. So I run a thousand sheep. Last year we turned over um, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the expenses were fifty thousand. So for seven million dollars, so basically this, this place sells for about would sell for about four thousand dollars an acre. That was uh, a few months ago. A place up the road sold for four thousand dollars an acre. So this place had probably roughly go for about that. Um, and then you've got equipment, there's $700,000 worth of tractors and other bits of pieces of equipment that are floating around here. And then you've got your livestock. So in the, the net value of this place, if you if someone walked in and said, I've got $7 million, would you sell it? I would say no, could, but it, in reality, you could buy a place like mine for $7 million. Um, the return on that is $250,000. It is rubbish like that. Mm. So $200,000 is my income from last year. Um, yeah, he's, the, the return on farming is terrible for the investment. You can do much better with $7 million as a return on investment. The thing is, you do get capital growth of the land. 
So rural land in the last few years has gone crazy. So two years ago, it was probably $2,000 an acre and, and just recently it started spiking. And I think this food production graph, like what people, the investors are starting to pay attention. The smart money is starting to pay attention that there's a food crisis built into the pipeline. So what do you do? You invest in, um, the, the Chinese have figured it out. That's why they want to buy farms. Mm, they, they figured it out a few years ago. They want to buy farms. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, they, they, they want their food to be secure too. So that's why there's this push to buy Australian farms is because we, we're fairly secure and, 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 our, and our food production is fairly secure. Um, although some of the rules that they're bringing with the border thing, everyone just needs to pull their head in with restrictions on border crossings for farmers. Like it, we haven't had a food cross, so people are, are taking their eye off the ball. They think food comes from the supermarket. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, it, it, there's just, most people are trying to spot Australian farms, but they don't realise what that means going forward. Um, it means there's border crossing mm -hmm. things. People just got to let the farmers do their thing. Um, and, and the reason they don't is because people haven't gone hungry. The bureaucrats in the city has got no idea what's going on. Um, and, but yeah, the Chinese understand. I think that's what's driven the food price in the last couple of years. The land price in the last couple of years is being driven by smart investors have realised there's a food crisis built in and where do you put your money? Where do you buy food production? systems yeah that's what i've noticed and what i've been seeing um well because obviously i'm into the property market and not just here in australia but in new york everyone's leaving new york and they're going to you know the countryside um people are knowing that things you know if unrest gets a bit high in the cities or crime may go up um people are wanting to start moving out create more self-sustaining life um be more safe more secure um and i've also noticed too that regional um you know in the past few years has outperformed where i live in the western suburbs in melbourne um i was looking at land um to buy and just the prices were crazy it was around 250,000 just for like 300 square meter shoebox piece of dirt um and i was like there's no way it's it's worth that and so i went out to ballarat and um i saw a 512 square meter block um it was only 130,000 so i thought that was a steal and um, lucky I didn't buy where I bought in the Western suburbs because a lot of people that brought, even though the developer says, okay, we'll sell you the price, the piece of land for 200K, it doesn't mean it's worth that. And then when the bank comes to value it, they can say, no, this land is only worth 170. You got to fork out 30K now to pay the difference. And if you don't, we're not going to be able to settle and you're going to lose your deposit. Um, so that's just something I'm noticing. And I guess you're noticing um, that people are starting to get interested in rural living a bit more. And also with remote work, um, and a lot of people be able to run their businesses online. I think that'll be another trend too. What do you think about that? Absolutely. The only, the only thing that worries me about remote, remote businesses is that if you can be remote from that, if you can be remote from your boss, there's no reason you can't be remote from the country. So there's no reason they can't outsource it to India. So if they've decided that you don't have to be there, then they'll outsource us to the cheapest person who's going to do the job. So instead of being Australian, then our wages are very high. Instead of being, or you could outsource it to the US. I think that, that you can pay ten dollars an hour instead of, you know, twenty five or thirty dollars an hour for an Australian. So I'd be very cautious with that remote working that it's going to it's going to be continual slip, and they'll start, you know why why pay for an Australian to do it when you can pay for an Indian to do it or. Yeah, some anyone else is going to be cheaper. I, that's that's a thin edge. But um, we're, I've noticed my small town here that property is getting snapped up. The houses are getting snapped up very quickly. They they're hitting the market and disappearing very quickly. I don't, it'll be interesting to see. And you guys, you're the you're the expert because you're following that that property market along with a few other Australian channels that are really focusing in on the data. Um, it'll be interesting to see how things shift. There. I mean, the only time that that population flow was during the 1920s that went from the country the city to the country. I think we're starting to see that again. Like you said, people want that space around them. They want to be closer to their food production system. Um, yeah, it all makes sense. Just the, the city's, yeah, bad news. Bad news when there's a bit of a crisis. The only thing that really concerns me in, in um, country Victoria, if we go more like Mexico, which I think we've got the potential to do it, where the security in the country becomes less because the, the cops get shot up in Mexico. You know, as the, as the pressure comes on and the population becomes less, I mean, civilization is quite in veneer. We're only, we're only civilised because everyone's got enough money and well fed. If that starts breaking down, the cops get shot up in the country, the country becomes lawless and the cities are where they can afford to have enough police and there's enough, there's enough density of cops to keep law and order intact. So I, I'm a little bit concerned and, and I'm shocked at how quickly everything's breaking down for... Um, and basically, law and order. Like, you know, the cops, the cops are getting rough, but there's also 
underlying issues. Um, the reason that the reason that they, I mean they're obviously copying abuse and stuff in Melbourne for the lockdowns. Um, everything's starting to fracture. You know, civilization is quite fragile, and I'm really worried. I'm worried going forward that we're going to end up more like Mexico, where the country the the country regions are being um, left to fend for themselves a bit. So that's a concern in the back of my mind. Security might not be quite as good in the country as it is in the city. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, that's something I'll, also I was thinking of and wanted to talk about, yeah, that I guess yeah, that's a, it's a double-edged sword with remote work. Some people like working from home, but like you said, they can offshore. And um, that's another reason why thinking about, you know, making a business is so key right now because, with offshoring, um, they can just offshore you straight away. There's also with immigration, there's more, um, you know, people that are happy to work for 15, 20 bucks an hour through immigration and also automation. So if you think, you know, it's too risky to start a business because, you know, I just want to do my secure job. I don't think your job is going to be that secure. And we're not going to have the wage growth in Australia that we had over the past 20 years. because we did have one of the highest wages in the world and we had a very high standard of living. I think Australia and Switzerland are up, uh, the top two countries with for the medium wealth um, because people have, you know, expensive properties and a lot in their superannuation. Yeah. Yeah. And it, if, if you're, but there is money available. If you're young and fit, for example, we're short of shearers. Now shearer, a shearer gets paid three fifty a sheep, $3.50 a sheep. Doesn't sound like much, but a good shearer can shear 250 sheep a day. So yeah. If, if, yeah, yeah. Think yeah. about now <laughs> the, the, the trouble is you've got to be mentally tough. You've got to be physically fit. Um, and you and you've got to put up with some crap learning to shear a sheep. Like it takes it takes a couple of years before you get anything like that kind of speed. And a lot of people never get that fast. Um, so the dropout rate for shearing is well over sixty percent. Um, but if you can do it, then it's, if you're young and fit. And the other thing is, I've noticed it a lot with um, the new generation that they're so used to being in air conditioned buildings, in air conditioned environment that they won't cope if it gets outside twenty four degrees, the wheels fall off. So if you're young and fit and you can cope with temperature variations and you're prepared to work hard, there's there's a huge amount of money to be made. Not not many people are prepared to get their hands dirty anymore. If you if you if you're happy to work eight hours a day and do the and just grind it out, there's there's heaps of money available. And you're working for yourself if you're a shearer. You're a com, you can be a contractor. So um, that money goes directly to you. You get you've got your car. You can write off. You've got your shearing plant. You've got all that stuff that you can write off your computer for and telephone. You get you get all those savings. But um, yeah, yeah, so if, you, if you're young and fit and prepared to put in, there's, there's certainly jobs available that, that don't involve sitting in front of a computer. That's a really interesting. I wasn't even aware of uh, how um, good, good money you can make with shearing if, you know, obviously yeah, you're young and fit. Um, and again, then um, if you want to move out in the country and the property prices are cheaper and you can still earn good money, you would probably have a much better quality of life uh, compared to, you know, paying a million dollars for a property and only earning 35 bucks an hour. Well, my young shearer that came here this year, my, my old shearer retired um, and, and, well, his son basically took over his front. So um, he's going to, he's 19, he's going to have his pay, house paid off next year. Awesome. <laughs> so, so you, 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 you know, you opportun- and then he's going to be, he's looking for investments. Mm. So, he, he, and, and his car, here's the key, his car would be worth less than 15 grand. He's not cool. looking to buy a flash car. Like he drives a four-wheel drive because he likes going out bush. It's not new, you know, it's got dents in it. He's, he's got spotlights on it because that's what he does. But, you know, it, it, if you looked at this young kid and said, you know, what, how much is he worth? If you park, it, you know, park, parking down, he'd be worth more than most people who are parking their cars down the road mm. and he's 19. So the, the opportunity to retire early, he, he, at 30, if he's smart, he'll be retiring at 32 from doing hard physical work. He might, a lot of, a lot of old shearers get jobs on the council driving their trucks and that, you know, they, but it, a lot of them don't invest their money wisely either, whereas he's got his head screwed on and just going hard and putting his money away in the right spots. So yeah, there, there's opportunities in the country that you're not going to get in the city. You, that, that kind of money that you can make fairly quickly. I mean, you started shearing at 16, um, you can make even more money crutching. Um, so crutching's taking the, the, the shit off around their ass. Um, <laughs> and you get paid a dollar a sheep for that. And, and you, get, you can do a thousand sheep a day. So you can make a thousand wow. bucks a day crutching. It's, it's hard, it's dirty and, and yep. smelly. And it's not for everyone. Like, don't, yep. don't everyone stand up and go, we're gonna, if, you, if you can't go outside and work in 35 degrees for eight hours a day, don't even consider it. Like, it's just, it, 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 yeah. If, and if you're not physically fit, 
don't consider it. But if, you, if you're physically fit and willing to put in and, and go hard, you, you can retire early and you can have a lot of money in your pocket. But don't think about a new car and that. It's not, it's not, what, it's not, not where the game is. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's interesting. Yeah, all these things um, I wasn't even aware of. Um, I think a lot of Australians um, aren't aware. They think, I think it's typical to think that you know, incomes are lower in the regions and um, there's not many jobs. But I've, I've all, where I'm moving to Ballarat, I have noticed there has been you know, more job advertisements coming up. There is more investment in uh, regional Victoria um, in Ballarat and um, jobs are coming. And uh, yeah, you can live a much higher standard of living. There you can have a bigger piece of land. You don't have to be locked up in a tiny apartment. And um, yeah, if you, like I said, if you're smart when you're young, you don't actually have to, you know, go down this path of being an employee, working for 40 years in a job, you know, you don't like. You just got to work our way young, put it away. Like I said, don't buy an expensive car because that will, you know, ruin you. Um, and just invest that money or figure out a way to make a business because even I'm sure if you do retire, you probably get bored and you want to get around something you're passionate about, create some kind of business or, you know, you may want to um, volunteer in doing something because you definitely, humans, you know, they don't just want to sit around and do nothing on a beach all day. Yeah, well, I do a lot of volunteering. I, I, well, until, uh, until we got shut out of it, I'd go to the um, old folks' home and I'm a bit of a musician, so I'd play, play my guitar. I'd take my dogs in, my working dogs in and, and let them pat, the, especially when I had a puppy. So that's all. And uh, I, I'm a CFA volunteer. You know, I've got time and, uh, and being a musician, there's, a, there's some other stuff I do, like music in the park and that. I take my gear down and set it up. Um, yeah, so... When you've got when you've got time and money later on, that's you, you, and, but but um, the young fellows this year isn't that volunteer on the trucks too on the fire trucks. So um, yeah, if you're part of a, re- a community, a small community, you've got to volunteer, you've got to put in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's part of country living. You, country, but if you want to, you said about jobs being scarce in in regional Victoria. That's true. If you're if you want to sit in front of it in an air conditioned office in front of a computer screen, you won't find the kind of jobs that are in Melbourne. You, you won't find those retail jobs. Not that there's probably many retail jobs going at the moment, but, but those kind of cushy jobs where you don't actually have to work, they don't exist in the country. You, if you want to make money in the country, you've got to be prepared to put in. You've got to, you've got to be prepared to do physical work. And, and even being a tradesperson in the country, you're probably not going to make the kind of money. The, the money that is, although farming, farmers are making more money now, so that's going to flow on. So maybe, maybe, but tradespeople, they don't expect to pay a tradesman $100 an hour in the country. They expect to pay more like 70 So there's more money. There's more money in cities from lawyers and doctors that are happy to pay $100 an hour for a tradesperson. Um, at the same time, if you, you, you can, people tend to split things up. So you can find electricians who are helping out insuring sheds or be just because the volume of work's not necessarily there. You don't have that density of people. But yeah, if you if you put in, like I said, you can be a fencing contractor, a shearer, a crutcher. You can you, you start off insuring shed as Rousey, which basically means you put, pick the wool up and you put it in the wool press, um, and and they pay two hundred fifty dollars a day. It's not huge money, but it's better than most people are probably earning, mm. and it gets you into the sheds, gets you into that environment. If you're if you're young and fit, they'll give you a go on handpiece, and then you can you can start doing shearing schools and that. And, and shearing schools are way better structured than they used to be. Yeah, they'll they'll get you shearing fast early. But, but like I said, if you're not prepared to do physical work, if you're not prepared to get hot and cold, yeah, don't consider it. It's not, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been a great chat with you, with you Rob. Um, I've definitely learned a few things about farming and stuff like that and, you know, the returns on a farm um, and uh, country living. Uh, is there any last piece of wisdom as a man, you know, that has made it, that has done it? Because there's a lot of people online, you know, 21-year-olds that, haven't you know started a business that are trying to give you know stock investment advice or you know, business advice is there any last uh, wisdom you'd give uh, to the australian people to how to get ahead yeah if you're young don't be concerned about going bankrupt like just it, like i wasn't when i when i was i was 24 i had a, i had a house that i was paying off i didn't i had a mortgage on it but i actually didn't care like i was like it just doesn't matter if you go broke if you go broke at 25 it doesn't unless you've got kids around you um, it, it doesn't matter if you go bust. Just get into it and have a crack. Like you're much better off having going broke at 25 and then having another go and going, I made a mistake, I can do it again. Um, you, you just hit the reset button. But yeah, if you don't take that risk, you're never going to make money. Like you've got to just go, it, it, the younger you are, the more risk you can take. Like the, the risk I took back then, I would, there's no way I'd do it now. Like I'm, I'm pushing 50, but my risk, my risk reward is not there anymore. I don't need to take any risk. Everything's, I'm very conservative with everything now. But when I was, when I was in my 20s, you just go for it. Just balls the wall, 
yeah, hit the hit, hit the red line. I mean, if you go broke, so what? Like, why is there stigma? Most 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 people who've made a million dollars have gone broke. They, they don't tell you that, but most people most people who are worth a lot of money. I, I was fortunate enough not to, but I was quite happy that it was just just yeah. That, people's risk appetite has to be there. Just if you're young, take the risk. As you get older, you wind your risk factor back. Yeah, simple as that. And then, but the other thing is, I'm really worried about inflation or deflation or. Um, being in the food industry means I'm protected because people are always going to have to buy the whatever. The, if we get hyperinflation, people are still going to buy these lamps for whatever whatever they have to pay for them or barter for them. Um, but if, if I was in the city right now, I'd be a little concerned. I don't know if we're going to get inflation, deflation or stagnation. And so you've got to hedge your bets. So if you've, if you've got, if you're older and you can't afford to get out of the city or you've, or you've decided that you can't, you're not going to be physically fit and go and do these sharing in that, which, which is most people are going to fall in that category. The investments you've got to make, you've got to be hedging your bet against infl inflation. You've got to be hedging your bets against deflation. So that means cash and, and physical cash. I don't trust the banks at the moment. Martin North does that, that, that talk with um, his offside. Uh, uh, is it? Oh, John Adams. I can see his foot. John Adams, that's it. Yeah, very good. Like, yeah, go and look at that. Like, just cash under the mattress. Not that you put it under the mattress, but somewhere someone's not going to know about it. And precious metal, uh, Bitcoin, and that. Just stay away from it. Like those those cryptocurrencies. Having been in the IT industry, I don't know anyone who's an IT security specialist who does the actual coding who has a bar of Bitcoin. And that should be raising red flags. If you don't know someone who literally writes the code and suggests you buy Bitcoin. And um, I don't think you'll find someone unless they're selling it and making money on the side. You know, the guys that are doing the coding don't trust it. So just stay away from, like people are going to scream, oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. But that's because they don't understand yeah. how it actually works. The internet is very fragile. Like it doesn't, it would not take much. I could personally take the internet down in Australia. You know, maybe one other person, but and I'm not going to say how I would do it, but the internet is very fragile. So you look what happened don't with trust guys. Yeah, yeah, and it's people can't get money. People can't get money, and but that bushfires weren't where you. Yeah, no, I won't say anymore. But the, yeah. the internet is the internet is extremely fragile. Like people have got this um, sense that the internet is there forever, especially especially younger people. Like I'm, I was around twenty when it started coming along on stream, so I can remember not having it. But people who've grown up with the internet just expect it to be there. Like they just expect it to be there like oxygen. But it, the, the fact is that it, the internet only exists because civilization is, is being calm enough that it's allowing the internet to exist in the, in the, way, in the format it is in. It's, not, it's, it's extremely fragile. And it, it only exists because we've got a proper civilization. And don't, just don't trust your investments there. Yeah, at the moment, don't trust your investments in anything unless you can hold it in your hand. Yeah, that's, that's my advice going forward. Yeah. Stay away from Bitcoin. <laughs> well, to be honest, yeah, I lost a fair bit of money in Bitcoin in 2018. Um, but yeah, it's just pure speculation. Um, the price, some people think it's going to replace gold, but I don't think so. But, um, but yeah, that was awesome insights, uh, Rob. I really learned a lot. Uh, thanks for uh, coming on the channel. Um, yeah, great, great insights. And like I said, I think um, having land, real hard assets is a hedge against inflation or it's a hedge against in one of the, if one of these fiat currencies go down, like what's happening in Turkey with Lira's going down. People are always going to need food. Precious metals also against and hedge inflation. But also with me, if I had my last piece of gold, I would trade that for for a lamb or for for a piece of meat or a piece of food. And some and some security. But if you if you're in if you if you get into this network, if you're in a small town, you'll know farmers anyway. And they'll always want they'll have a lot of firewood split. Or you 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 can go and that's what I like. People say what what happens if civilization breaks down and people start stealing your lambs. No one needs to come and steal my lamb. I will give someone a lamb, but they'll have to do some work for it. So they're splitting cutting firewood or something. You, you can, even if you've got no money, you turn up in the country and you're prepared to put a little bit of work in, you will be fed. You're not going to go hungry in the country. It's not going to happen. Yeah, so, yeah, that's my advice going forward. And, and congratulations on your channel too. It's exploding. You're doing really well. Yeah, so Thank fantastic, you, Michael. So if everyone can hit the thumbs up and bloody support Michael's channel, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, guys, yeah, like for the uh, algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thank, thank you, Michael. Thanks again, Rob. It was great chatting with you. It was great for your insights um, on your yeah, farming, how, what it's really like being an Aussie farmer and what it's really like to um, become financially independent, someone that's made it and someone that's lived it. Uh, thanks again and uh, looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Catch you later.